It's away from Ninkovic. He's some 30 yards from the line of scrimmage. This is going to be a monster sack. <laughs> 29, 29 yards. yards. Good memory, good spacing again. Tim Tebow it's sees Ninkovic out of the corner of his eye, spins, but the defense is ready this time. Yes, it was history of the wrong kind. Unfortunately, if you were a Bronco fan that day, <laughs> my name is Jim. I'm a, I'm a volunteer. I work down the street. My paying gig is from the math department. I see some of my former students here. No, we're not going to be talking about math tonight. <laughs> we are going to be talking. Yeah, thank goodness from, from the peanut gallery over here. But we are going to be talking about taking the loss. <laughs> That's right. And so this happens to be the longest loss by a quarterback in NFL history, tied Bob Lillysack of Bob Greasy in the 1973 Super Bowl uh, back in the day. Um, so we are in the middle of a series exploring this idea of taking the loss. Uh, and if you think about what happened on the football field, if you think if Tebow just would have had the presence of mind when that first 300-pound man with lots of gear on was coming after him to either take a knee or to throw it away, he could have lived for another day, right? Instead, basically, game over after this play. If you happen to be a Falcons fan, any Falcons fan in the room? Or not? How about not Patriots fan? Yes, that's right. I'm a Cowboys fan and not a Patriots fan all at the same time. You remember the Super Bowl in early February, right? Second and 11 on the 23-yard line. Three minutes to go left in the game. Matt Ryan steps up to the line. All they have to do is basically run out the clock, kick a field goal, and the game is over. He takes a 12-yard loss back to the 35-yard line. And he says after the game is over, and of course we know what happens, Tom Brady finishes off one of the most epic comebacks in Super Bowl history, unfortunately. And after the game, Matt Ryan's interviewed. He says the one play that he wished he had back was he wished he would have had the presence of mind to choose to take a smaller loss instead of this larger loss that was imposed on him. It would have given him the chance to have one, two more plays, and they had a great field goal kicker that could have come in, iced the game, but he didn't do it. So the question that we are exploring in this series, this Lenten series as we head to Easter, is this. Is it if we choose a loss as opposed to having one imposed upon us, is it possible that something greater may be on the other side if we take this loss? And in the, in the context of this series, we've talked about several different topics. Uh, one of the topics happens to have been, or several of them, oh, sorry, this is our theme verse, back, actually, where we get this idea from, comes from the, the apostle, uh, from Jesus in the Apostle John's uh, letter. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of earth, wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. So some of the things we've been talking about, I think we're on the next slide here. Losing, what does that mean in general? Money, How does, what does it mean to take the loss when it involves money? What does it mean if, uh, if we can go back one? Maybe. I'm trying to see if my slide clicker is, there we go. What about friends? Matt talked about friends last week, and this week we're talking about not friends or bad friends, and in particular, enemies. What does it look like to take the loss in the presence of our enemies? And I, I, I'm, to be honest, I was preparing for today, I'm thinking, why did I choose this topic? This is such a difficult and hard topic. And I'm going to give you the punchline up front right now. We're going to talk about loving our enemies. We'll be in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Luke 6, the Sermon on the Plain, we'll be in both of those spots. It'll take us a little while to get there because we first have to think about and consider the idea of what is an enemy. Now, I don't know about what image pops in your mind, but I'll tell you, or I'll show you the images that popped up in my mind. The usual suspects, perhaps, uh, Dylan Roof. Decides he wants to terrorize black people and shoots up a number of them in uh, uh, Charleston. Obviously, Osama bin Laden decides he doesn't like the values the West represents, so he decides to take lives in the United States and elsewhere. Timothy McVeigh from back in the 90s didn't like how the federal government was operating, decides to uh, bomb the, the Murrow Building in Oklahoma City as a, as, a, as a symbol of the federal government, killed a number of people in there. And of course, the guy on the bottom decides he didn't like how white officers in Dallas were treating black people, so he decides last summer to take out a few of them. 
So the usual suspects, people who don't care about somebody's life and decide to do something about it. So perhaps one or more of those people are our enemies. Or maybe it's a political system of some kind. You have the Russian flag, the Chinese flag, the Iranian flag. Perhaps these represent a threat to our nationhood or not, a threat to our economy or not, a a threat to our way of life or not, depending on your particular point of view. So perhaps we think of other governments as enemies. Of course, depending on your political persuasion here, you may think one of these is an enemy of some kind because what, they, what do they do? Again, it all depends on your p- political persuasions here. Perhaps they establish policies that take away something that you value or they establish things that uh, add to other people's lives that you don't think is the right thing to do. So there's things that are going on on the political realm that we often have deep issues with And politicians and their policies become our enemies. A little bit closer to home here. If any of you are around the fall of 2015, depending on what you think about freedom of speech, free speech, safe places, the myriad of issues of race and culture that came out in the protests in the fall of 2015, my guess is, depending on whatever side you find yourself on, There's somebody in that picture you might think is an enemy. Or maybe it's an employer who fires you. I I talked to a friend of mine yesterday. He uh, started a business with two other guys. He was in business with them for 23 years. Two years ago, the people he built a business with said, "You're, you're done, you're gone. And he doesn't know why. So guess who became an enemy to him? two years ago. Or maybe you've experienced betrayal. Maybe you have somebody that you love that you find out is actually taking the love that you've given them, putting it away and giving their love to somebody else. Maybe somebody that you think very highly of is actually stabbing you in the back, shooting you in the back somehow. Maybe that person is an enemy to you. Uh, one in 20 women on college campuses experience sexual assault. One in five, I'm sorry, one in five women, one in 20 men do. In a room of 100 here, probably 25 or 30 people in this room right now understand that something of great and deep value has been taken from them in this experience. And there's a sense of somebody, maybe somebody that they know, maybe not, is an enemy. Wow. What? we do with this? It's a question we're going to ask tonight over and over and over, and this is, who is your enemy? Because the reality is, I have enemies, Lucretia has enemies, Josh has enemies, Sherlyn has enemies, my wife Anne has enemies. We all have enemies of one kind or another. Maybe they're not up on our radar screen right at this very moment, but they will be at some point and some time, and we have to understand what does it mean to take a loss in the face of an enemy? And when we think about who is our enemy, I think about the images that I put up there, and there are many, 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 many more that I could have put up there. And I think that they all have one thing in common. And it's this. An enemy is somebody who either takes or threatens to take something very valuable away from you. Something in the sociological world, something that people would call sacred, perhaps. You place high value on this, somebody actually takes it, And you experience the pain and the wound in that moment, or they have a threat to do that. And so what do you do? We begin to protect. We begin to defend. Of course we do, right? So what does it mean, if we refine our question just a little bit more, what does it mean to take a loss when it involves somebody that is actually in the process of taking something from us? I think this is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult topic. Difficult one to engage. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn, jump over to Matthew 5. We're going to look at some of the words of Jesus in this passage. It's going to take us a while to get through this because there's some important context that we have to understand. And begin to explore the punchline, which I've already told you. How do you take the loss? You, you actually love your enemies in an unexpected and extraordinary way. But what in the world, what does that mean? I have no idea. So let's begin with the first line in Matthew 5, uh, verse 43. 
you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So I want to focus in on this phrase, you have heard that it was said, and give you some context. It's really important to sort of understanding some of the things that Jesus tells us in this. Um, you, I don't know if you've heard of some people called the Pharisees and the, and the scribes. These are people that pop up in the New Testament. They're very religious people. And it turns out that their history started back in the exile, which was about 600 years before Jesus came onto the scene. And what was happening at that time is Israel had become a great nation. God had promised Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. You will be a blessing to many nations. And over many, many years, over ups and downs and lefts and rights, God was faithful to bring that promise to fruition. And probably, arguably, we see the highlight of this promise being most fully expressed under the King David. And what do they have under King David? They have land. The territories and the tribes are united under God and under David. They have a temple, plans for a temple that gets built under David's son Solomon. This place, this temple represented the, the place where God met the nation, the religious center of the country. It also represented the political center of the country, the judicial center of the country, as well as the economic center of the country. So in the temple, this is a very, very, in, in Jerusalem, this is a very, very important thing. Uh, now what happens is over a series of 300 years, 400 years, things begin to sort of decay through a series of bad decisions by, by, by many, many people. And around 600 B.C., the Babylonians, the enemies of the nation of Israel came in and they destroyed the temple, they destroyed Jerusalem, and they hauled off all the, 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 the leaders uh, of the nation of Israel to, to Babylon. So what happened in this context the identity, the things that formed uh, the essential identity of Israel, two of those three things were gone. One of them was land, that's gone. The other was the temple, that's gone. But a third one remained. That was something called the law. Now what the law is, it's, it's what we consider, in part, what we consider the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. And what this is, this is a record of God's promise to, to Abraham how God, uh, and how God, the journey through many, many, many years of God keeping this promise and finally how it is fleshed out um, in, in land, yeah, over, over, over many hundreds of years. And so they had this, and they had this one thing. And so what do you think they did? They said, we want to preserve as much of our identity as we possibly can. So we want to focus on understanding the great principles in the Torah. So a class of scholars arose They began to, to try to write down what these great principles might mean in everyday life. And, and they began to write down with great precision and great care. And so out of a sense of we want to preserve our identity, we want to protect ourselves, we want to keep what remains from the enemies that have taken all the rest of it away from us, we want to preserve our identity by taking care of what we have, that is our law. Now, over time, there's a, cl a, a class of, of laymen called the Pharisees, which means separate to, they're, they're separate from, they, about 150 years before Jesus came on the scene, they became a part of this whole plan. And they particularly were interested in, in keeping the law in precise and pure ways. So, so, so in this line right here, when, it said, when we say, you have heard that it was said, Jesus is referring to this class of people they care deeply about the right thing, deeply about preserving the identity of the nation of Israel under attack from people who have taken things from them, basically. That's the idea. So, so one of the things that, that I'm going to sort of point to as we talk over the next few minutes is, is this. When we have enemies who take things from us, we naturally, and of course, try to preserve our identity in certain ways. This starts to ping and, and, and hone in on who that we are. So enemies take, we defend as we naturally do. And so these issues of who we are and our identity become very, very important. So I need to tell you a little bit about how this works or actually didn't work very well for me. I'm going to tell you about uh, me and a, a friend of mine named Bill. So Ann and I lived in Colorado Springs, Colorado for 12 years, from the year 2000 to 2012, uh, before we, we moved out here in 2012. I mean, at the time, I was teaching mathematics there. That was my paying gig. But we also, as we do here, we like to volunteer and to help out and become involved in the local church. And so we were involved in a church there, and they needed some help 
with a group of 20-something people. They didn't have anything for them, really. And so we've all, we, we started something. And beyond our expectations, for sure, this, this thing's where it started to take off. And we find ourselves loving being with people who are just right out of college, most of them, all of them were single, helping them figure out how do you do life very, very well? And, and how do I follow Jesus in order to do life very, very well? And, and this consumed hours and hours and hours of our time, but we loved it. And part of the reason I think that we loved it, now that I reflect back on this, is we were in year three or year four of what turned out to be a 10-year journey of infertility. We didn't have kids at the time. We desperately wanted to have kids, and it just wasn't working out. And and so we decided to get involved. We had a sense of calling. We wanted to use the gifts that God has given us. So we get involved, and this thing just, just takes off. And after a year and a half, two years, we have 150 people running around. And yet we find ourselves in these amazing conversations when all of a sudden somebody, you you realize somebody is giving something of themselves to me, something deep within their souls, and allowing me to hear and to see and to be a part of this deep thing that God is doing in their hearts. And they probably not tell too many other people about it. And I love this sense of purpose that I had in those kinds of conversations when you find yourself with people making significant, life-changing decisions. And so despite this deep disappointment with infertility that we were having, we had this sense of God is using us and I'm exercising the gifts inside of me and there's a sense of purpose, a sense of value, the sense of this is what I was cut out to do. Yeah, I like teaching math, I love that. It's great, it pays my bills, but I love this other thing that I'm doing. So a year or two into this little little. Uh, process. Uh, uh, the guy that I reported to on the church staff, his name was Bill. And so Bill is an athlete. He's a thinker. He, he, he's a kind of a guy's guy. He, he's kind of a person that you just really enjoy being around. He also was able to talk about, you can have these amazing conversations with him. And over a two or three year period, uh, I would say that Bill became my best friend. And I found myself given to Bill these kinds of things, these nuggets about who I was, things that I didn't necessarily want oh, too many other people to know, this vulnerability, because I trusted him and because he was such a deep friend. And so they had this just great, amazing relationship. So disappointment with infertility, a sense of value and purpose from the things we were doing as, as volunteers, and, and this really significant friendship, uh, of which I've had maybe three or four other friendships like, like I had with Bill. In, in my entire life, probably. I show up to a meeting in the spring of 2005, March 16th of 2005, and Bill tells me, Jim, I am removing you from your position as of now. And I said, whoa, why? And he said, well, I'm going to tell people that we don't see eye to eye philosophically. What are you talking about? I mean, I had actually helped Bill write the vision statement and develop the philosophy of the ministry that he oversaw. I probably knew about more about what was in it than he did because I helped him write it. And so I just knew that wasn't wash. And I said, okay, um, I don't don't agree with this. He said, well, it's too too bad. You're stepping down, and on April 4th, we're going to have a celebration for you. I'm like, I don't want that. You're removing me. I don't want that. I said, well, can I tell my leadership team? I had a group of five or ten people that I was very close to. He says, nope, I'm going to tell them. Um, it was basically the clean out your office right now, and we're going to escort you out the door moment. I'm going, where is this coming from? I'm getting fired. I'm a volunteer. I'm not even getting paid. But I'm getting, somehow I'm getting fired in the process of this. And, and so for me, uh, in that moment, my friend Bill guess what? He took something from me that was of great value and I would even say sacred and he became an enemy in that moment. Of course what happens when this sort of thing happens, it doesn't make sense to people. Bill starts telling people, people didn't buy, didn't buy his explanations so he had to tell them other reasons that may have a grain of truth but not, not a whole lot of truth but a grain of truth just to, to justify the decision and then all of a sudden just this, the, the community that we had together of 150 people explodes 
in the smithereens. I had people come up to me and say, Jim, I want to know, what did you do? Who did you sleep with? Whose money did you take? What did Ann do? Uh, I mean, so, some version of that kind of question. So all this question is, Jim, I know that there's something wrong here, and probably you are at fault for it. And I'm going, I don't know. I said, please tell me. I don't know what, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. And so when I found myself in the process, of this, the, my community was taken away from me. The things, the, the things that gave me value and a sense of purpose was taken away from me. And it just emotionally, I just, I just cratered inside. I just cratered. And I found myself asking two big questions. Who is God? How can God be involved if a guy that's on church staff pulls this kind of boop? Mm-hmm. And uh, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Because what, who I thought I was, how I thought I was following God with everything that I had is now, it's, it's wiped away. So I understand when an enemy takes from you and you seek to begin to protect and defend, these questions of who am I kick into gear in fierce ways, I think. So let's go on. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The the love your neighbor phrase comes from Leviticus chapter 19, and it is in some sense the foundation of Jewish ethic. It's love your neighbor as yourself, and and many, many things have been written about this. And, And so what's going on is the Pharisees and the scribes were quoting scripture, and remember, they are seek to protect the Jewish and Israel identity. That is their job. But what has happened is just uh, somewhere along the lines, in the midst of this protection thing, they were off just a little bit. And then 10 years later, they're off just a little bit more. And 100 years later, just a little bit more. And now, 600 years later, when Jesus is writing this, they're off course correction. And and, and in fact, um, I'll I'll just say the phrase that I I think of when I think of this. They had become, the, the law of God had become their God instead of the God of the law. They were busy about chopping and slicing and dicing, and they missed the God that was behind the law. You know, I think of it like, this is a Eugene Peterson illustration. I think of it like this. Uh, we did a remodel in our house two years ago, and we have a pond in our backyard. It's, it's beautiful. And, and part of the remodel was we want to be able to see the pond, so we want to put lots of glass there so we can see the pond, and that's, that's what we did. And, and so in, in the pond, you see hawks, you see blue heron, you see osprey occasionally, you see turtles, you see frogs. And frogs and frogs and frogs, about many thousands of them come June, early June. And you see otters. We saw a beaver the other day. You see all sorts of really cool wildlife. And so we want to see that and we want to experience it. But, but when it rains like it's been raining the last couple of days, well, you get some water stains on the windows. So you have to go out and wash the windows, right? So we wash and clean the windows. And then a few days later, the birds come along and there's bird droppings. And you've got to clean the bird dropping off. And so we do that. And then you think, well, the windows are kind of high, so maybe I should get some, some tall ladders and some scaffolding so I get some scaffolding so I can get up and get the high part so where the spiders get up there and they really cause a mess. And so you, it enables us to do that, right? That's really good. And so you get the, the best squeegees possible and the best buckets possible. And so every day we get out there and we clean the windows because why? We want the windows to be clean. And, and this is the thing that we do. We clean the windows. And so what's happened? i become a Pharisee because I'm about cleaning the windows instead of looking at the pond. And if you come to our house, you know that we don't actually clean the windows that much. <laughs> but you get, you, you get the idea of what's going on. So, so, so when you see love your neighbor, yes, that was in Leviticus. But this bit about hate your enemy, no, no, that was not a part of the original Torah. And it's evidence that they have gotten off course. And so they have juxtaposed this idea of love your neighbor with hate everybody that's not your neighbor. And basically, who was not a neighbor was everybody that wasn't a Jew or everybody that was not in good, a, good, a Jew in good standing. So which pretty much meant almost everybody was an enemy to, to, in, this, in this context right here. And so Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and, and hate your enemy. And what we see here is that when enemies take it, we defend, we have a risk of losing our identity. So, so the ironic thing is, in the very 
uh, the very purpose of the Pharisees and the scribe was to preserve identity, but somehow they lost the story, they lost the narrative, and, and, and created a new identity that was different than the one that they set out to preserve. And if we do this when we have our enemies, when we do the necessary thing, I think, defend ourselves and protect ourselves, we do the understandable things, we have a risk of sometimes crossing into areas where we lose the narrative and we move into areas that are not healthy and harmful, and that is not at all what we set out to do. So what's the antidote to this? And it's what we start out, start out with. Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I think this is a very, very difficult saying. So, so what does it mean to love somebody? So I'm going to jump over to, to Luke 6. This is the parallel passage uh, of the same thing. And this gives us some sense of, of how to think about this. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. So basically, love your enemies with a little bit more detail. And here we go. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. Okay, that's, uh, uh, allow yourself to be humiliated is what I, I hear out of that. Okay, if someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Okay, if I love somebody, I should be willing to be standing naked out on the street. I guess that's what that says, right? Uh, give to everyone who asks you. So we walk out the door, then I, my, my wallet's going to be empty in about 30 seconds probably because somebody's going to ask me for money, okay? Uh, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Just give away everything you have. So, so on, the, on the surface, this is what love is. This, is. this is what Luke is trying to tell us. This is the kind of love that is required of us if we are to love our enemies. So on the surface, it sounds like humiliation. Well, the good news is, it's not humiliation, but it's still a very difficult thing. So, so this, is, this is hyperbole. It's the idea, what Luke is doing, he's trying to shock the reader and to noticing there is something really important going on here that I want you to pay attention to. It's not humiliation. So let's take these four phrases and sort of tease them apart just a little bit. If anyone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. So, so, so let me make an observation. If somebody's going to slap your cheek, you have to be in close enough proximity to that person that this can happen. So if they're your enemy, what, what do we tend to do? We defend and we protect we, 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 we close it off, baby. There are walls that go up, and if you're my enemy, there is no way in hell you're going to get close to me because I'm not going to let you do that thing again. I am not going to let you do that thing again, right? So maybe a part of loving our enemy, maybe, is taking a risk to put ourselves in their proximity once again. And what this does is, the, the slap is not a punch on the cheek. It's a slap on the cheek, which is a symbol of insult. And, and so what I take from this is, if we are going to love our enemies, it is a very, very risky endeavor where we will risk rejection. That whole identity thing, that, yeah, we risk that getting stomped on yet another time by our enemy. What Jesus is calling us to is not humiliation, but they're willing to risk proximity, so and even to the point of rejection again. If somebody takes your shirt, do not your coat, do not withhold your shirt. This is a picture of vulnerability. Uh, give to anyone who asks. This uh, another way to think about this: love is generous, even when people have taken from you. It does if anyone takes what belongs to you, it does not demand it back. It withholds revenge, and it withholds retribution. So maybe we can take these ideas and put them together in this way. Love risks generous forgiveness. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, love your enemy and pray for them. Okay, me and Bill, part two. So, um... I, I didn't respond very well to, to this, this kick in the, mm-hmm. I, I didn't respond very well to it, right? And, and so this whole, mm-hmm, the walls thing, whoop, they went up. I, I was, he and I had many, many mutual friends. And so I kept, began to replay in my mind over 
And over again, the moment when he would come and confess to me his sin and the wrongness that he had done to me, I began to play that over again and again. I, I mean, boy, what was I going to say? Was I just going to you know, give him the gut punch? Was I going to be nice? Was I going to be nice and still give him the gut punch? You know, I mean, this, is, this, is how, this is how it went. So there's, so proximity, no way. And so he called me, he sent me an email actually a week later and said, hey, it's March, it's March Madness, come hang out with me and your buddy Dave and let's watch the game together. I said, you got to freaking be kidding me. You, you haven't come and put, gotten down on bending knee and apologized yet. you got to be freaking kidding me. I said, no way. So, didn't. Um, what else went on? Uh, generosity, generous, that was a difficult one. Uh, I, after this happened, I, I, this was such a, a difficult thing for me. I, I said, i gotta, I got to talk to somebody about this. So I got a mentor and, and named Randy, and he, 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 he began to help me think, Jim, what does it mean to be generous? And of course, I'm a follower of Jesus and had been at that time for many, many years. And so I, 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 mean, I know this verse, this, this one that we're wrestling with right now, a little WWE. I, I know this verse. I know it up here. I know it intellectually. I know that I have to love him. I know that I need to forgive him, and I know that I need to pray for him. And so what did my prayers look like? It was, uh, I, I, I could get about five seconds into a prayer, and then I'm done, I'm gone. <laughs> because I can't emotionally engage, I can't intellectually engage, and I still can't intellectually, I don't intellectually understand a lot of what happened. I understand better, but it's still confusing to me. Um, a year passed, two years passed, three, I think it was about two and a half years later, we, I happened to be in Atlanta, this to Nan's brother, we were, we were in a, a church, and the, the, the preacher was preaching, this whole stupid forgiveness thing, you know, and, and it became, you know, what I knew up here started sinking down lower, and I knew, right, it started sinking down here, I knew, I, I, had, I had to reach out. After the basket, hey, Jim, do you want to hang out and drink beer and watch basketball, which was ridiculous in my mind, I, there, I hadn't heard from him that, since. I knew that I needed to put myself in proximity with him, and so I just sent him, hey, Bill. You know, can we get together and talk? I mean, it's been a while. Maybe there can be some movement in our relationship. So we got together and began to talk. Anne was there. Bill was there. His wife was there. My mentor was there. It was honestly an awkward conversation. Uh, one, one of the things that had, uh, many things that had come out of this, we, we, we started, it became clear we could not remain at the church that we were at where things had imploded. And so we began visiting other churches. And of course, I, I want to, it was my identity. It's being involved with people who are uh, 20-something. So I began to say, hey, go to these churches, visit. Hey, I think this is a place for us. Can we help out some? And, you, oh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, you're the guy. I've heard about you. Oh, and this happened with the two or three churches. It's the same kind of story. And just, just like loss after loss after loss. And so we're sitting there with, sitting there with my friend Bill. And honestly, in the middle of this, I just sort of became paranoid, just irrational about some of this probably. Like, I, I, just, I, just, I need a letter from him. I need a letter so that when they say, oh, I've heard you're the guy, I can say, well, here's the letter. And so I asked for this little box check. And, and so Paul said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. But it became clear to me. I, and so we, we met, we talked, a little bit tense conversation. I, I finally put myself in proximity of Paul. We began to have honest conversations. Uh, they didn't go, uh, they, they were, they were, they were what they were, right? Uh, a step forward, but not a resolution, I should say. Got a letter. It was perfunctory. It was clear that Bill had checked a box. He had written a letter of sorts. He did, yeah. I've never shown the letter to anybody. It sat there. Steps forward. So what happened out of that? Small steps of freedom began to come my life. And, and this is where I think I want to go next uh, to, to help explain a little bit of this. Yeah, verse 45. So, so, so here, here's the thing. We, we've got this identity thing running around, right? We have enemies that take from us. We preserve. We defend. This, this hits at the core of, of who we are. Of course. Of course it does. And, and Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be, what, healed no, that you may receive mercy. No, that you may be forgiven. No, that you may get better. No, that you may have peace. No, 
It has nothing to do with compensation, that you may receive anything, does it? It has everything to do with identity, that you may become a child of the Father in heaven. That's a subtle but important signal. Now, I think, I do think that if we step into this different identity that God has for us, that of a child of the Father in heaven, it has some serious implications and probably we will receive mercy. Yes, we will receive a sense of love from God, or at least we'll be able to access it. It exists, we'll be able to access it, we'll be able to see it in new and different ways. So what I'm going to suggest is that in this moment when we step into this new identity of a child of the Father in heaven, this is a step into strength and freedom. So let's think about why this is. When you say, I will risk to generously forgive you, that's my form of love, what you are saying, you are making a very, very strong statement that you were wrong, you were wrong, you violated something sacred within me, but yet I choose, I choose to enter into a new identity and forgive you anyway, despite what you have done. So it's, it's, it's a statement of strength, not a, straight, a statement of weakness, number one. Number two, it's a statement of freedom. And, and it's this child image right here that you may be a children of the Father in heaven. So what do children do? Well, they do lots of things, of course, but one of the things they do is they imitate their parents for both good and bad. <sighs> I've got two kids now. They're 10 and 9, and yeah, we see this, some of the good imitation, and we see some of the, oh my gosh, what, is, what was I thinking imitation? Um, but they imitate their parents, right? And, and so we see this in the very next slide. For he, that would be the father, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, the father is free. He, he, gives us, he has a son and it is beneficial to all, to those who deserve it and those who don't deserve it. God is free to give his reign to the righteous and to the unrighteous. And so if we are to be children of the Father, we have freedom to enter into this thing where we can bless those who have hurt us deeply, those who have taken something sacred out of our life. Another thing to mention about this passage, when it says love and pray, uh, it turns out that uh, these are present active imperative, uh, imperatives, which means that, that you, you don't care about that. But what you do care about is it means that you should love and 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 love again and again and again and again. It's not a one-time perfunctory statement that you make. So when we forgive, when we enter into forgiveness, we are not, it is not a one-time deal. And so when I reached out and chose to be in proximity with Paul, that was the beginning of the forgiveness cycle for me, not the end. And, And what it did is over time, the door began to open up and I began to get some answers to these two big questions that I was asking in my heart. What, who is God and is God a good God? I wasn't really sure about that at that time. And, and, and who am I? This began finally started to unwind in some significant and important ways. And, and just, if it's not clear that this is really a, a lot about identity, uh, let me say this. Risky, gen- generous forgiveness allows us to step into strength and freedom. That's where we've been headed. It goes on. So if it's not clear that this is about identity, this makes it a little bit more clear. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get are not even the tax collectors doing that. So the tax collectors, these are enemies of the Jews. So, so, so what Jesus is saying, do not your enemies give good for good? You're not particularly distinct. You're not all that different. You have a similar identity in many important ways to the tax collectors. Uh, and if you create only your own, if you treat your own people, hey, it's us. Uh, do not even the pagans do that? The pagans are another class of enemies at that time for the Jews here. And and so what Jesus is saying, you're going to step into this new identity that will give you strength and freedom, but there are certain parts of who you are that aren't particularly distinct from your very enemies. And, And so the commands were what? Love and pray. And so what prayer does in the midst of this loving activity, this risky, generous forgiveness that we have to do, what prayer does, it allows us to see our enemies in the way that God sees them and begin to realize, ah, maybe there should be some grace there that I have difficulty giving because I've been so hurt and so wounded. To love, pray, risky, generous forgiveness 
gets us to the very end. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I'm a mathematician, so I think of perfect in terms of logical rigor. And I don't think that's what this is talking about. This is a, a Greek word that Matt and some other, you know, Steve, you, you, yeah, you, you know the Greek better than I do. So it's telos is the Greek word. So it has the connotations. I know this because I can read well, not because I actually know Greek well. It has the connotations of maturity, wholeness, uh, doneness, completion. And, and so when the commands is be perfect because your heavenly father is perfect, I think I, I read this as an invitation to step into completeness and wholeness. So, so maybe let's try to pull back and pull the talk together to, 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 the final, to, to the end here. Enemies take. They take. We defend. We protect. We can, and in doing so, sometimes we return evil for evil. This hits at the heart of who we are, at the heart of our identity. Jesus, however, on a, is, is in an upside-down way calling us to love our enemies with risky, generous forgiveness. This allows us to step in as children of God to find strength and freedom in these moments and wholeness and completion. Here, the word is perfection. So, what questions do I have for you today? So if the worship team wants to come on up, this would be a, a great time to do that. So, so first off, who's your enemy? Do you have one right now? Is there somebody that's taken something of great value from you, perhaps something that's sacred to you? Uh, and as you interact with the enemy, and maybe it's as I did for many years, I interact right up here, imagining those moments when the confrontation <laughs> happens, right? Uh, or maybe it's actually in proximity with your enemy. H- how does this affect you? How does this change you? Because it, because it does, it It does. And what does it mean to risk? I mean, it means something different for all of us. What does it mean to be generous? What does forgiveness, the release of the right to have revenge, the release of the right to have retribution, what does that look like for you? So we're going to give you three different ways to respond here in just the next couple of minutes. The first way is, is the worship team will begin to play. It's just in your seat before God. As you think and pray and try to connect with God, maybe there's something that, that, that comes to mind in, in that process. The other is we have our, our communion elements here, and we have some bread or some crackers if you're the gluten-free, like the gluten-free kind. And this represents the body of Jesus. And when Jesus, as we're in the Lenten season, and, and we will begin to talk more and more about this, as Jesus was on the cross, he looked down at those who had put him on the cross and what he did, he had this generous forgiveness. He said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what that they do. And so when you take the communion elements, maybe what you are, one way to think about this is I choose to identify with this crucified God. I choose to identify with this God who took a loss, knowing that the possibility of resurrection is on the other side of it. And in doing that, as you engage in this way, perhaps the possibility of something greater, the possibility of resurrection in your life becomes the probability of resurrection, perhaps. And the third way we're gonna ask you to engage is we'll have some people over here to pray. If you're like me, and this will happen in a few minutes, if you're like me, I I just need to talk to somebody sometime. Uh, I need to ask somebody to think with me what might be some answers to these questions? And so we'll invite you in a few minutes to, to choose to do that as well.